This past weekend, I contributed to Superbase because they didn't capitalize the S in Superbase on their homepage in one paragraph. And I made a PR and it was merged. And so, so sometimes your PRs can be massive in actual features and sometimes they can be really small things. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Stack Overflow podcast, a place to talk all things software and technology. I'm your host, Ben Popper, Director of Content here at Stack Overflow, joined as I often am by my wonderful crew of co-hosts, Cassidy, Siora, and Matt. Hey, y'all. Hello. Hi. Hello. So I wanted to touch on a podcast that I listened to. It's from the folks at Coindesk, which is kind of like a news source for all things Crypto Web 3, and they were talking about the complexity bomb, which is a thing that will happen on the Ethereum network where it'll get much, much harder to mine Ethereum to the point where like it would just slow down all the transactions and create the quote unquote ice age where like people would just stop mining because it's just not worth it. So it's this thing that can happen, this sort of mathematical change, cryptographic change that changes how the algorithm works. And so they've been trying for a long time to change Ethereum from proof of work, which is like your computer does a lot of work, to proof of stake. Somebody stake some Ethereum, some money um, to make sure that the network runs and that the transactions are validated. And to me, it was just, this podcast was just like the epitome of this is what would happen if your entire company was run by developers. It's like, <laughs> they keep being like, we, we've got to change to Ethereum 2.0. But then they're just like, oh, but it's going to take more time. Like, ah, oh, there's a few bugs left. Like, ah, oh, just give us a few more weeks. And then there's this thing that's supposed to happen. This complexity bomb is supposed to go off and be a forcing function. So what they keep doing instead of working on Ethereum 2.0 is they keep moving the complexity bomb back. They keep pushing the deadline on the bomb going off to give themselves more time to work on this other thing, which they still have not finished like two years after they said it was going to be done. And I just thought like, I don't know. I just, this to me is like the quintessential room full of engineers with nobody being like, whatever it is, we're shipping it tomorrow. Like, I can't, we're done. I don't even know how to process it. It sounds all like their engineering team is a complexity <laughs> bomb. Ha, 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 ha. Is this like a hypothetical issue or like something that's actually going to become a problem? The, the complexity the bomb future? is real and they've pushed it back three times now. So it's like this fake uh, forcing function where it's like, if you don't get your work done, like this is going to happen. And they, they keep being like, well, we'll just move that back and then we'll do more work on the thing because it's not ready yet. It, it'll be ready soon. So keep moving the bomb, like further down, kicking the bomb further down the road. Um, and it's just like, you know, I understand. I, this is like a classic trope of like, here's what, you know, your boss says you're going to deliver. And here's the engineer like in their head calculating how much time that's actually going to take and like what they're going to strip out of the request. But on the interesting thing about stuff like Ethereum is it's just an open network of developers. Like it's all done by consensus and participation. And so like, that, that seems to be feeding this environment of like, let's just keep kicking the can down the road. There's always going to be another bug to find. There's always going to, we can always make it a little bit more, you know, perfect before we release it or whatever. This is what happens with decentralization is, is because there's no central authority that says this is when it has to ship. This is when it has to happen. Is there any decentralized solution to this problem though? Like, is it possible to solve this without having a central source of authority to be like, here are the deadlines. You have to get this shipped by this date. I mean, I think the things that prove mm -hmm. it out, right. It's like, you know, a Linux or something that's open gets really, really far and makes a huge economic impact. On the other hand, yeah. Matt Cassidy, correct me if I'm wrong. There are maintainers and originators there who have a little bit more say and can kind of force a decision when a decision has to be made. You know, you could argue that Bitcoin and Ethereum have cr changed the world and created a ton of value and inspired a lot of people, you know, in their very open way. Um, but Ethereum now is getting bogged down and it's beginning to sort of like, I mean, look, they, they could solve these problems and they've come up with some really cool ideas for Ethereum 2.0. This particular story just like, really to me, it was almost like a cartoon, you know, like a a satirist version of like, how many developers does it take to change a light bulb? Like they... <laughs> They, you know, without somebody saying like, it's ready, it's good enough, like they will never, ever ship Ethereum 2.0. It will never be good enough. It will never be ready. It will never be perfect, you know? There are going to be people listening to this podcast who work on that Ethereum chain who are just probably tearing their hair out right now being like, you don't understand. Look, I want to know. <laughs> I want to hear it. And, you know, like I'm rooting, I root for projects to succeed. Um, you know, this is just my response to this one editorial and maybe they mischaracterize things. 
Um, I do know that, I mean, I, I do know for a fact that this is something that people thought would happen one, two, three years ago and hasn't because I've been discussing it with people since then. So the timeline on when it would happen definitely keeps moving. Git was decentralized until, and, and still is technically, until like GitHub became a thing and, and GitLab and, and Bitbucket and stuff to centralize it as a place where it can be. And so we we see that with some crypto things where there there ends up being some level of authority that, that pushes things forward and and there's all kinds of committees for everything out there it feels like so there 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 might be something that helps but kind of like what you said but i this this might just be a unintentionally <laughs> yeah. comical yeah yeah look look i'm not saying developers can't accomplish anything i'm just saying this one feels like particularly hilarious because obviously it's a ton of cutting edge people and just just also the fact that they hold this thing like if we don't get this done this bomb is gonna go off oh no no we're just we're like, you know what just move the kick the bomb another hundred days down the road it's like that was the whole Put point a of the bomb on get it? It? yeah that's when the work <laughs> ends before the bomb goes off we agreed on that all right let's move on to our next uh link um this has come up a few times on the show before siori you mentioned wanting to work on your first open source project and um cassie i know you have experience here if you wanted to find an open source project to contribute to, there's a bajillion of them and many have lots of stars and they have many reviews. So how do you figure out where you should put your effort, be helpful, and in that way sort of get involved? Yeah, I'll kick this this one off, this topic off, because um, I have talked a lot about the importance of open source, especially for people who are new to the industry, who are self-taught, things like that. Um, and I think we usually focus on how you contribute so the whole get etiquette and pull requests and all that kind of stuff and that is actually just half the problem knowing how to contribute is half the battle now you have to figure out what to contribute to and obviously there are like probably billions of projects on github at this point and so that's a huge issue it's like okay i know i've watched this tutorial or this video or this talk or whatever on how to contribute now how do I find a project to contribute to and that's the problem I confronted many times I've discussed it before I've given a talk about it before as well I've written written an article about it before and I came across one recently that like I really liked because it outlines a bunch of different ways to contribute and a lot of them to me are I feel like beginner friendly I should say like they list out finding projects that you already probably know of or use packages that you already know of and use that are open source so that you can possibly contribute through that um there's also a lot of like open source initiatives out there and then there are a lot of like um one thing that I found useful is that a lot of open source projects will use the tag I think it's like first first time contributor is one of the tags good first issue there we go yeah good first issue and then like another one that's like beginner friendly or something like that i can't remember now but anyway you can look for those tags in like popular open source projects and a lot of um projects that are actively maintained by open source people have tags like that so that it's easy to find like things to contribute to that way so also i'm opening up the floor to everyone else here too who's like involved in open source to like you know, give people some tips on like finding places to actively contribute to. I like that one that you mentioned, sort of like, hey, maybe you're already working with these tools and you didn't realize they're accepting yeah. contributions, so you can check it out because that's kind yeah. of like, like you get a chance to support your local software merchant. Um, you know, you're <laughs> the person who's <laughs> helping you. Yeah, and like you would be surprised about how much software or tools or websites or whatever that you use out there that actually are open source. Like, there are a ton out there that actually are like the website that hosts the article that I'm referencing is dev.2 and that is an open source platform so like that's a place that you could contribute to like you would be just shocked to know how many of these platforms and websites and packages and things like that are actually open source and need contributors I think there, there's another community that I also recommend called COS community which is commercial open source community and it's also looks a lot like dev.2 because it's built on the same open source software. Um, but it's interesting to find a bunch of open source startups there. And, and I've mentioned it on the show before. 
your open source contributions don't have to be huge. And sometimes I think you can find out what you might want to contribute by just using a product that you want. Where this past weekend, I contributed to Supabase because they didn't capitalize the S in Supabase on their homepage in one paragraph. And I made a PR and it was merged. And so, so sometimes your PRs can be massive and actual features and sometimes they can be really small things. But it's it's really kind of just getting yourself to do it. And And I think checking out all of these startups out there that are open source products. And, and also um, there's a website that I think I've mentioned on here before, uh, Code Triage, um, which uh, we can share in the show notes. It it's just shows all of the issues that these startups might have or that these projects might have. And you can kind of just jump in and see which ones might be useful. Is your secret dream to be issues. a copy desk editor? I think this is like the third or fourth time you brought up that your open source contributions are finding that missing comma. <laughs> <laughs> Typos are just the easiest things to contribute. We can be like, I'm doing my part. Um, I've I've done larger ones, but it is definitely fun to be able to fix a little thing where you're just like, this is a very immediate gratification because it doesn't need testing. It's very obvious when it's just like capitalizing the H in GitHub or something. I did like one of the tactics, I guess, in the article to <clears throat> find open source projects to contribute to was to look into organizations that have been participating in the Google Summer of Code and outreachy because those projects typically are catered towards people coming in and contributing for the first time. A lot of the documentation is there, the structure and clear guidelines as to um, how to actually contribute, I think is a really good uh, launching point as well. Yeah, I actually just um, remembered a website. It's called goodfirstissue.dev. And it basically um, curates a bunch of uh, open source projects that have issues with this tag. I think... Um, and it like curates them. You can like, uh, display them by language and all that kind of stuff. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I wrote an article before on making your first open source con contribution. And like someone suggested this in the comments as like a good resource to go to if you're trying to figure out, um, where you can contribute to. Cause like I said, I think this is like a huge way that you can get, um, practical experience. I feel like, contributing to open source probably closely mirrors what you would do as a developer on a day-to-day -day, more so than like building a project from scratch so um so yeah I think that's a great article that um not great article a great website that people could go to 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 check out if they want to find some issues to work on as well. All right, y'all, jumping on to the next one here. Uh, this is a pretty cool write-up of the creation of spring animations by a few of the Figma engineers who wants to dive into this for us after dropping the link? That was one that I saw, and I, I love deep dives like this. So this is from a company called Figma, which many of you probably know and love. Um, and it was written by um, Ricky uh, Rajani and Willie Wu. And basically, they, they did this deep dive into how they created their new animation system. So the, the reason why I found this really exciting was that instead of just like having a problem going to documentation, finding the solution, and going back, they kind of gave an overview of the whole system. They figured out that the animations that they were using had kind of like basis in real world physics. So they looked at research papers. They looked at how a spring actually operates in terms of its physical um, uh, kind of like movement. They incorporated um, properties like mass, stiffness, and damping, and then translated those into like a user-friendly way to animate your um, buttons or whatever else that might be. I think it was a really interesting use case of them having to go and do research, find out like real world things, and then translate in that into programming code, as well as kind of like a user experience design. And I'm curious, Cassidy, Sior, and Ben, if you've had a situation like this where you've had a development problem that you've had to kind of like think outside the box, go and do research, and then come back with a solution. Yeah. Usually when that happens, I give up. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. <laughs> there was one time when I had, um, uh, I was trying to build a project that was actually a lot more complicated than I initially expected it to be. And to this day, I have not finished that project. <laughs> but um, I'll just explain the issue and maybe we'll get someone who will respond to help me figure out this issue. So, what happened was I wanted to create my own search engine and it was supposed to be like an image search engine because I have 
like a ton of memes saved to my phone and it's so hard to try to find the perfect one (laughs) for the perfect situation like given a situation like if someone says a funny joke i want to find the meme that i have saved in my camera roll this is good i want to invest (laughs) (laughs) but the thing is it's a lot more complicated than i expected it to be like to actually i would need like machine learning to analyze the photos and like pick out keywords based off of the photo so that when you search whatever key term, it brings up the right photo. Like it's actually a lot more complicated than it sounds. And I was like, I don't feel like training a machine learning model or anything like that. Um, So I, (laughs) I kind of abandoned the project, but it's still in the back of my mind because I still use memes unnecessarily like too much and it's so hard to find the right one that I have in mind and I can't like search it in my camera roll so anyway that was like my issue and it requ- it would require me to like dive into machine learning and how to like do all that image processing and stuff like that and I just was like I don't feel like doing this <laughs> <laughs> very quick side note Ciara I literally worked at a company like this are they and going to help me? We build? had an app that said oh, that. it doesn't exist yeah. anymore. Yeah, so th- so we they sunsetted oh. the app, but the API <gasps> still exists. Oh, nice. And the company I worked for was called Clarify, um, and it's Clarify but with an AI instead of a Y at the end. And then there's another company called RoboFlow that also does something similar. They have APIs that let you train machine learning models easily, and then you can use them. To can make you put apps. this in the show notes so, so that I can like <laughs> heck yes. possibly get back to this project? <laughs> This Figma doc was so, so interesting, and it reminded me of uh, this one developer who actually recently joined Figma as one of their developer advocates, Jake Alba. I don't know if you've ever followed his work. I'm also going to drop his code pen in the show notes because he makes the most interesting and cool web experiments where sometimes I'm just like, I don't actually understand how you pulled that off. Um and and like he'll make musical instruments using his webcam where depending on the color of the object in the webcam it changes how the music goes or uh he'll he'll play around with with so many interesting experimentations and animations and things and i i'm sure he's doing awesome things at at figma right now but uh i i love seeing people get creative with code and and just diving in deep to the physics of something or the math behind something i remember the the coolest code pen i've seen in a while was somebody meticulously created pickle rick in in css and it was just that the the level of detail that went into such a silly thing i i love seeing that passion for something where somebody was like i want to do it it's got no use case for anything outside of this but i'll do it anyway And I'll spend 20 to 40 hours of my week doing it. That reminds me a lot of like um, CSS art. Like CSS art sometimes is unnecessarily complicated. And even like with a spring animation or any kind of animation, it looks so simplistic. You would think that it is. And the same goes for like CSS art. Sometimes it looks so simple. You would expect it to be. It looks so like, and everyone everyone bashes CSS as like being like not real programming, all that kind of stuff, which is a conversation for another time. But some CSS art I've seen is like so fascinating. And then when you try to do it yourself, it's so hard. <laughs> yeah, It's literally so <laughs> difficult. So I used to be super into CSS art and I will also share my code pen, which is sorely outdated um, in the show notes, but I used to do what I called Code Pen Thursdays, where every single Thursday I would dedicate an hour to just trying to make something with CSS art. And and it started very basic where it was glorified rectangles, but slowly got a bit more advanced over time. And, and I would just like go on Dribble, find a design and try to recreate it in CSS. And it was such an interesting learning experience where I did this for a couple of years. And you can look at my Code Pen now, codepen.io slash Cassidoo. And some of them... I'm pretty proud of. They ended up turning out okay. Some of them are private <laughs> for a reason. Oh, wow. But it's something that I learned so much from it where like now if you give me a layout, I could probably do the CSS layout pretty quickly because I was able to learn so much from it. I feel like CSS art is also a great example of learning through building because I 
I recently like I haven't I hadn't played with CSS in a long time outside of like basic layouts and stuff like that. So I wasn't like I was just doing the bare minimum. And then I was like, you know what? I'm going to do some CSS art. I tried to recreate a K-pop poster for one of my favorite groups, <laughs> of course, very own brand. <laughs> and that like taught me so much more about CSS and like just layouts and all that kind of stuff just in general and different CSS properties. And I think that's like a great case for like how building something, creating something with whatever coding language can help you to learn it in a very practical way. Um, so anyway, a, another practical one of my and, like... And playful, which is like makes it fun. Easy yeah, to sit down and practice. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I feel like that's like the best way to learn how to do something. And like, that's a great way. If someone's trying to learn CSS, right. that's a great way to do it. Nice. I had a quick look at Cassidy's code pen, by the way. And this is the cutest code pen I have ever, like, there's, for, for anyone looking at this, she's got a, so I'm just going to give you a live review of your own code pen. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, but this, <laughs> like, the, the rice ball dessert that you did with the little, like, rice balls and the soup is so freaking oh, yeah, cute. Yeah. The um, macaroons that you've got that are animated, and even the Land Cruiser is so sick. Yeah, go check it out in the show notes. I'm, I'm a big fan. This topic has come up several times on the show already. So clearly there's some interest. We're waiting with beta breath. Apple's game-changing VR headset could be coming out in January, says Analyst. Eh, this thing's been about to come out for two years. But um, yeah, people's, people are eager to see Apple jump into this new product category. They always come. They always wait until they've really like made something so different and better one thinks except for their home speaker but like basically they have they've had a good run um (laughs) so yeah fingers crossed they enter this market could be really cool is this kind of like another example of like engineers i guess is would an engineer create this thing some sort of engineer taking forever to finish something because they want it to be perfect weren't we just kind of like talking about this earlier it's like we tied everything no you you make a great point (laughs) Full circle. That's what I our do think that, are. Um, I, I wrote a couple stories about this in the past, but two things. It was like Steve Jobs, you know, was kind of like the CEO and co-founder and with a, had a really firm hand in like the product, you know, like what they were going to make and what it was going to look and feel like. And that was an example where one person's vision meant when he said it was not ready, it was not ready. When he said it was ready, it was ready. And everybody just worked to make it as as, as best as possible, but it was not released like by consensus. It was like, a benevolent dictator, right? Like, luckily, he got it right, and his sense, his product sense was good. But you know, he was he was a real jerk to a lot of people along the way. You can you can read it in his biography. Um, and then, yeah, I think from that, Apple kind of took this approach of like, our thing has to be has to change the game when it comes out. It can't just be like we're competing on all the specs and on price. But without like that, Steve Jobs, now it's kind of like, well, what are you waiting for? Like, how many years are you going to wait to? You know, like I hope their VR headset is light years ahead of everything else because it's four or five years late to the market so it better be (laughs) you know (laughs) yeah the best i have some concerns about the vr headset to be honest um and and the reason for that is that doing a lot of things with virtual or augmented reality requires quite a lot of gpu grunt and macs are not known for their gpu performance they're historically quite low in that regard and I'm concerned about the fact that Apple are developing a VR AR headset that is, I'm assuming it's going to work really well with Macs, but for people who want more grunt behind their um, their experiences with like a 3080 or like a NVIDIA graphics card or whatever else, they're typically like Apple are very good with integrating with their own silicon, but when it comes to like opening that up to other ecosystems, it doesn't work as well. So I'm very, I'm, I'm anxious for them kind of knowing all of that, how how this is all going to work together and whether or not that's actually going to give a good experience to people and what the re- development requirements for these experiences are going to be on an Apple ecosystem. All right, y'all. Well, fingers well, crossed. We'll see. Continue to monitor this situation carefully. We'll report back when we know more. <laughs> um, we, don't have, we don't actually know anything anymore, but we're here to, we're here to give some opinions. All right, y'all. Um, let's jump over to our Rex. I don't have one today, but I see... Two, two blue links and a super dumb but equally cute link. So let's hear it. The, these are all tech wrecks from me that are 
range from kind of dumb to actually quite fun. Um, okay. So <laughs> the kind of dumb one is Samsung and Starbucks have released this. It is like, it, I find it very cute, but it's these this like Starbucks coffee cup um, holder for your Galaxy Buds. And you kind of open up the top lid of the coffee cup with the coffee on it, and it's got your earbuds inside. I think that's quite adorable. <laughs> okay, very... good. I'm glad. <laughs> <That's very laughs> the, the other recommendations I have is um, just in relation to some of the resources that I talked about with the um, uh, the Figma Spring animations. There's a really really cool um, Spring style animation tester, so you can. Um, it's webkit.org slash demo slash spring link in the show notes, but you can go and like mess around with mass stiffness, damping and initial velocity of, um, of a dot. And it'll kind of give you an idea of how each of those factors play into like creating a smooth animation and how that actually looks on screen. It's like quite an intuitive, fun little thing to play with if you're interested in animations and, uh, webkit and all that sort of thing. Yeah, and I think I'll throw in, uh, it's a recommendation that I kind of mentioned before, but that COS community website, I'm not wildly active on it, but it's been really interesting to see updates on open source companies and just details, not not just about like their funding rounds, but what, what they're working on. And I've been able to discover some cool projects with that. I'm trying to extend my home office range to like some pretty remote spaces. So I've been researching things where if there's any cell signal at all, you need to have like one bar, half a bar, then it will boost it. And it'll be like one bar is three bars, three bars is full bars or whatever. So I've been doing some research. There's a couple companies out there. WeBoost is the one that comes up a lot. But if anybody's listening and has played around with this, very curious to know. Also looking for one that's battery operated. These all need to be like plugged in. You could like bring a battery, I guess, that has like a 12 volt or whatever, but trying to uh, work from the campsite sometime this summer so interested in getting a, a I, I've got, cell booster lte booster i've got a feeling that ben just wants to do a podcast from the top of a mountain while like an <sighs> eagle casually soars behind him <laughs> you know i gotta i gotta turn this remote lifestyle into something while i still have the chance all right everyone thanks for listening as always we appreciate it and now a shout out to the winner of a lifeboat badge who came on to stack overflow and saved a question from the dustbin of obscurity helped spread some knowledge to our community Thanks to Victor Zakharov. How can I find whether a number is even or odd using C? All right, y'all. We appreciate you listening. As always, I am Ben Popper, Director of Content here at Stack Overflow. Find me on Twitter at Ben Popper. Email us with questions and suggestions, podcast at Stack Overflow. And if you like the show, leave us a rating and a review. really helps. I think, oh, and I think by the time you listen to this, there'll be a video version. So go check us out on YouTube. And there we are in living color. I'm Cassidy Williams. You can find me at Cassidy, C-A-S-S-I-D-O-O on most things. I do developer experience for remote and OSS Capital. My name is Sierra Ford. I'm a developer advocate at Off Zero. You can find me on Twitter. My username there is Cioreo. That's C-E-E-O-R-E-O -E -E underscore. I'm Matt Kienander. I'm a developer advocate here at Stack Overflow. You can find me online on YouTube and Twitter at Matt Kander, M-A-T-T-K-A-N-D-E-R. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for listening. We appreciate it, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.